Karen Woody, we had just a hugely significant case involving the Securities and Exchange Commission and Solar Winds. From your sort of SEC and law professor angle, what about this case intrigued you so much? Oh, I got to say, I have some mixed emotions about this topic because the opinion of a couple of weeks ago now essentially gutted the argument of a paper I've been writing for probably years. <laughs> so the gist is, sorry, there's someone drilling right outside my house or something right now. I'm trying to make that go away. All right. So solar winds, that's what this topic is about. Um, I've been thinking about this, talking about this topic for almost 10 years, at least about the internal controls provision, which I'm going to focus a little bit about for today. There's a lot to talk about with solar winds, but I really want to think about and have been thinking about internal controls. That's the angle I want to focus on, but let's talk about what happened. So solar winds is a company that sells high end and allegedly secure software to government and private entities. Um, they were charged by the SEC, and I'll talk about what that uh, those allegations look like. Um, also charged, I know that'll be of great interest to this panel, it was Timothy Brown, who was the vice president of the company who was in charge of the company's security, so the, basically the CISO officer. Uh, and so the SEC complaint against the company and Mr. Brown, you know, alleged a couple things. So first is sort of garden variety securities fraud. They said solar winds had been misleading in their description of their cybersecurity practices and products, particularly around its flagship Orion software platform. And they basically said they were understating what the cybersecurity risks really were if you got these products. So there's a bit of an overhype about how, how effective the Orion software would be. That a lot of that happened in what was considered the security statement that the company put on its website, but also in a range of other publicly made statements, including filings they made with the SEC. So there you have the sort of standard, you hid the fact that the products and practices here actually weren't sort of airtight cybersecurity products, but instead were fairly porous. So they say this, again, company's puffery is misleading the investing public. Because, of course, there was some serious vulnerability to cyber attacks that this software had. So that was one. The other major issue, and the one that sort of comes to the forefront in the news, was that there was a significant cyber attack called Sunburst. That sort of was the culmination here. There were, I think, a series of cyber attacks. But this all sort of comes to a head in December 2020 with this large-scale cyber attack that was called Sunburst. And that was allegedly done by hackers based in Russia, and it very much targeted that Orion software platform. And there's some discussion that the customers had already been buying into a corrupted product because there had been potential exposure to hackers as the company was still selling the Orion platform, like I said, to Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, Homeland Security. Department of Energy. There are a lot of very important customers who are using this cybersecurity software that didn't work. And so because of that, there's sort of two, there were two categories of issues that the SEC was alleging that, that gets cat that sort of get bucketed into pre-sunburst and post-sunburst. And based on all this, there's a number of charges, obviously a 10B5, some section 13, meaning what they're putting in the periodic reports. 17A, that's another fraud charge. I, I mean, what I said at the outset here, what I really wanted to sort of think about and talk about was the 13B2B violation, which is it's a part of the statute I've thought a lot about and written about before. So 13B2B, this is your internal controls charge. So what 13B2B says is that every issuer with a class of securities traded on our on our exchange has to provide reasonable assurances here that they should devise and maintain a system of internal and accounting controls sufficient to provide reasonable assurances that, you know, everything that you could imagine an internal control would do. So in, ensuring that the transactions are uh, correct, executed according to the correct level of authorization by management, that they're not accessible by others, sort of just a classic lock it down, get the internal controls square. So this provision actually arises from the part of the code that is linked to the FCPA, so the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so, I, I mean, I've, I've written about this provision now for almost 10 years, and, and that 
in the first article I wrote about it, it was called no smoke and no fire. Because if you think about what the FCPA was designed to do, you have an anti-bribery provision, and then you have what's usually bucketed together, books and records and internal controls. So things are usually, there was a bribery provision and then there's accounting provisions. That's how that was seen. That's where we get 13B2B. So I was always a little concerned about the SEC and DOJ coming out with only internal control violations, which really was nearly a strict, was a strict liability charge, essentially, which is maybe the thing didn't happen and maybe you didn't even account for it wrong, but you wouldn't have caught it had it happened. And that was at least my initial point about this, which is how do you hold companies liable for this? So that's why I was saying you're dinging companies for maybe having a defective smoke detector, essentially. I still think that's a problem to have a defective smoke detector, but is it rise to this level? So I sort of initially came out saying this is a little overused by the government because they're not able to prove up these other substantive claims. So anyway, now that's a little bit of an aside because let's get back to what the judge says here in SolarWinds. So it's a 107 page opinion that was issued a couple of weeks ago by Judge Engelmeyer. And what happens is the judge essentially tosses the majority of the SEC's suit here. And the, like I said, the one I wanted to really think about here was about how they're saying, he says the internal controls provision has to do with accounting. This is a cybersecurity thing. Those things might be separate. He also challenged that the SEC wasn't able to meet its burden of proving scienter and said, you know, these allegations by the SEC really rely on speculation and hindsight and like all cases, everything makes a lot more sense, you know, in the 2020 view of hindsight, just, yeah, something went wrong and somebody's mad about it, which is why it's kind of a strict liability level thing. Something just went wrong. So we're dinging you as opposed to, did you do as well as you could with what you knew at the time or maybe a negligent standard? Science is even further than that, which is you intended to uh, make sure this thing went wrong or you certainly intended to mislead investors about this. So there's sort of a spectrum of culpability. And as I've said, internal controls really is at the very end of just, even if something didn't go wrong, you wouldn't have caught it had it done that. So really the judge says I'm tossing the internal accounting control claim because really this was a novel claim about a company's cybersecurity failures. He calls the SEC's complaint ill-pled because he says cybersecurity does not fall under what that provision was meant to capture in terms of accounting controls. What to make of this? It was a really big, it was a big swing and a really big sort of loss essentially for the SEC. I, there's the caveat, there are a few claims that's, that remain that deal more with the sort of pre-sunburst claims and the, the IPO claims that the company had. So there still are some hangers on in terms of the SEC still has maybe some area to, to still try to move forward with their complaint, but the majority of this was tossed. And so what do you make of this? At least as far as the internal control provision goes, I know that a couple of the SEC commissioners have claimed that they thought their commission was going too far on the use of charging 13B2B and calling it the Swiss army knife of the code, much like we saw with mail and wire fraud being the Colt 45 and Stradivarius. 13B2B seemed like an analogy of that, like just ding them for internal controls. But now we have a significant narrowing of that to me. Like that means financial accounting controls. I think you can make the argument maybe that cybersecurity can very clearly have a one-to-one -one link to the financial. Like, I don't know if you can totally divorce those. I think there could be some daylight on still a broad reading of this if you anchor it to a financial and accounting type provision here. But I think it's a really interesting thing. I mean, it raises a number of things and you can, I think just the things we talk about in this podcast alone, you could see there are overlaps. You can clearly see the overlap to the board here. The internal controls that we usually talk about in terms of care mark review, things like, I mean, all of this, I think is going to snowball and have tentacles in other places when you just talk about the concept of internal controls. But here, I think this was a really important case for a significant narrowing of how at least this particular judge and the courts are going to look at this when the SEC is calling everything internal controls, at least under 13 B2B. So that's my, again, maybe niche take on that. But I'm curious about what this group thinks. Well, we're going to start with Mr. Armstrong. I've got a few things. I'm going to repeat the same phrase again. It's all about the dollars in a way, isn't it? Um, the stock price dropped from memory when mm -hmm. they announced the attack. So that's not insignificant. But the other thing I was 
particularly struck by obviously in the CISO community this is a case that gets talked about a lot and it's bracketed with cases like Carlos Abarca, a UK case, and Joe Sullivan, of course, a US case. And I know that some software vendors, etc., are selling this as a win for Brown, but it isn't a win for Brown from the scan reading I've done. As you say, some of the pre-sunburst claims remain, and Brown is He's fingered for those, isn't he, in, in some respects, because I think there are website claims, et cetera, et cetera, that he seems to have made from memory about accreditation and the fact their ability to withstand the tracks. So this isn't a defense of CISOs. And in some respects, the judge is saying the opposite, that CISOs can have personal liability if they make claims that aren't true. Is that a correct reading? I think that's right. I mean, I think you're right that the CISO community shouldn't take much solace from this, even though it looks like a bit of a, a win somewhat for the defense, or at least certainly it swiped a lot at what the SEC was alleging. But I think you're right. For Brown, he's still on the hot seat. There's still claims that move forward, that are moving forward with that, about him individually. So I think there's significant exposure for CISOs still after this case. Do you have a question or comment for Karen? I suppose I do have a comment here. I find this ruling frustrating because on one hand, yes, the judge is correct that when the statute says internal accounting controls, there is an assumption that we are talking about accounting and that is not cybersecurity. On the other hand, it goes on to talk about management control of uh, assets. And if the asset is data and it's been manipulated by hackers, then clearly the asset was not used according to management's wishes. So that seems like a weakness, but I actually look more broadly at some of the other cybersecurity cases here. And I think that this ruling really thwarts a lot of accountability for some of these other companies. For example, United Health, two days before this judge made his ruling, the United Health reported their second quarter results including how much money they were spending on their devastating cyber breach that they suffered in February. It was roughly a billion dollars in the second quarter alone. But United Health also disclosed how this breach happened is because they did not apply multi-factor authentication onto a critical server of the subsidiary that they had purchased 18 months or so before. And that was the weakness that let the hackers get in that caused United Health to shut down, you know, half the US healthcare system for like two or three days. But that was a basic block and tackle cybersecurity maneuver. And not only that, but when you acquire a business, aren't you supposed to perform due diligence? Isn't that supposed to include cybersecurity measures? And how did this get through? And United Health CEO pretty much said, we're still not sure how that happened. And that seems like a glaring weakness of internal control. And in the SolarWinds case, this judge now just said, an SEC, you can't bring any charges as a result of that. With United in particular, United Health, I think there's still going to be several ways to hold the company accountable. I think the Federal Trade Commission is going to have a field day with them. But the other big thing to look at is this CrowdStrike disaster, where CrowdStrike pushed out a flawed software upgrade to thousands of companies that caused all sorts of mess all over the place, all of those companies. You incorporated a software update from a third party without checking it, without putting it into a little isolated sandbox system to see what it does and then implement it. You didn't do that and your system crashed. And there's a whole lot of people who will say, Matt, that's not fair. This was a Windows, we trust Windows. Who on earth in the IT world trusts Windows to run well? I learned uh, you shouldn't do that when I was like 22, 30 years ago. That is not a valid excuse in my opinion. But so all these companies that suffered from this CrowdStrike disaster, are they now going to disclose that they had a material weakness in their IT controls? Because you did, but they're not going to. And even if they did, what's the SEC supposed to do about this? So this ruling sort of defangs our ability to hold companies accountable for cybersecurity Mm -hmm which is the only way to make the company take it seriously. And what are we supposed to do about this? And that is my big concern, because if I were the hacker types in Beijing or in Moscow or Tehran or Pyongyang, 
I'd be taking detailed notes on what just happened in the United States with CrowdStrike, with this disaster. I hope they're not listening to this podcast because we've just painted a way to show that there could be real threats and disruptions that happen to this country. And we are blissfully just not building the mechanisms to get that taken care of. It's astonishing. Yeah, I actually agree with everything you say. The sort of really lawyerly part of me thinks this is what the statute says. And I actually think the judge had a faithful reading the statute, but it doesn't mean that there should be a gap filler here. Otherwise, there should be a cybersecurity internal control provision, as opposed to piggybacking on the anti-bribery internal controls from 1977 that were shoehorning everything into. I think that actually is the, is the I mean, it's not clean because you need Congress or at least the SEC to write a rule. So, so it's going to still be a, a minute, but mm-hmm. I, I do think that's sort of sort of my thought of like pushing this statute maybe beyond what it's supposed to do is maybe not the best mechanized mechanism for this but yet also there should be some mechanism for exactly this there should be some cybersecurity controls that are required instead of maybe trying to lump all of that into 13 b2b just call that internal controls and, and move on and, and i do think you're right it smacks of mission critical type stuff from caremark cases of just especially when you are solar winds and this is the thing that failed like i mean it's, it's sort of I don't know. To me, it seems like that there should be somewhere in the code a way to success successfully charge these things and and not have your case gutted the way they just this. I'll geek out for a second. As from a financial reporting perspective, would they have this thing? It's called contingencies. And if it's probable and reasonably estimable, are you supposed to record it? If a cyber incident is supposed to be happening to all these organizations, maybe they should be recording some type of liability for these things. But that's a topic for another day. I agree with you, Karen, that there, Karen, uh, Karen Woody, not that I don't disagree with you, Karen Moore, but I agree with you, Karen Woody, that there, I don't think the judge really understood sort of the linkage between cybersecurity and Matt made a similar comment and the financial statements. I think the big thing here is disclosures and the balance that you have between security, security concerns and disclosures, that fine line, that balance. Those are things that we talk about all the time with our clients is what's enough without really giving everything away. We live in this world and Jonathan Armstrong talks about this ad nauseum, kind of going around the horn here with regards to what do we need to put out there and what's required and what's not required from a security perspective, from a data privacy perspective and things like that. So I think we're still, I, I don't know that case is over yet. I mean, I know the SEC got beaten up pretty bad there, but I don't. I'm having problems to linking the fact that if you look at 13 B2B and you really understand it, and then you look at how companies really operate in financial statements and disclosures for a publicly traded entity, it, I'm still miffed by it. Now, the solar winds thing, that, that whole debacle, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I think that was a giant worldwide crisis management exercise, and I think many people failed. <laughs> 